everything is data. Right? Well, maybe there's no spoon. We might not live in the matrix, but today we're going to learn about an amazing technique to analyze and understand complex data sets, the proper orthogonal decomposition. Then we're going to use this technique to look into some fluid dynamical data and reason through why it makes sense to do so. Let's do it. All right, so let's first consider we want to represent two measurements acquired by two different instruments at the same time. Now, let's assume we take a time series of these measurements. We can still represent each one of these measurement points as a combination of the original individual measurements, but it might be more insightful to choose a different set of basis vectors to represent this data set as a whole. This is the principle that guides the proper orthogonal decomposition algorithm. We want to find a set of basis vectors such that we can better represent the data that we're handling here. So let's first note that in this case we have more data points than dimensions. So this problem has really no exact solution and what we're trying to look for here is a way to optimize the representation based on some criteria. So the POD algorithm is defined such that it maximizes the energy along each one of its basis vectors sequentially such that each subsequent basis vector is perpendicular to all of the previous basis vectors. So a little complicated, so let's first define the first basis vector that we seek to find. The energy of a point along the basis vector will be defined as the length of the projection of the point onto this basis vector squared. We will then sum all of these squared lengths together for every data point that we have. This will give us a number to work with, which is actually the norm of the dot product between the data matrix A and this tentative eigenvector E1. Now we want to do that for every possible eigenvector in this 2D space. And in 2D, we can plot this overall norm as a function of the eigenvector of angle theta with respect to the origin. For higher dimensional data, plotting this function might not be very simple, though. Note that this dot product function has two maxima. We can pick each one to represent the eigenvector along the direction of maximal energy. Now that we chose our first basis vector, we choose the second eigenvector to be perpendicular to this vector. In 2D, the solution is pretty obvious, but in a higher dimensional case, we have to solve a similar problem. Once we find the second best basis vector, then we proceed to the third basis vector, making it perpendicular to the previous two. And we keep on doing that until we run out of dimensions in the data. In fact, POD really shines when the data set is, has a very large number of dimensions, where the underlying data is noisy and complex, but the rules that generated this data are somewhat simple. So let's have a look at how we're gonna deal with these higher dimensions since we can't really use this kind of point cloud plot anymore. We can represent each one of these data points by a list of numbers, uh, one for each dimension, in an n by one matrix. In this case, a 3 by one matrix. This is a good way to represent the data in a computer, but most of us will probably appreciate a more visual representation. For example, we can assign a color to each one of these values according to a color scale. In this case, red represents positive numbers, white represents zero, and blue represents negative numbers. These 3D point coordinates we were working with were actually a part of a much larger set of pixels of a computer simulation of a cylinder in crosswall. Each image we're looking at here is really just a reorganization of a very long 1849 dimensional vector. Then every snapshot that we take of the simulation is another column vector. 
We can represent this collection of column vectors as a 2D matrix, which is the key to start really understanding and interpreting the results of POD of higher dimensional datasets. Now, let's formalize the definition of our proper orthogonal decomposition. We have a data matrix A, whose columns represent the snapshots of the data, flattened into a single column. Each column of A is a snapshot in time. We want to decompose the matrix A into three matrices. The first unitary matrix, U, is the matrix of basis vectors, or modes. Each column of this matrix is a mode that represents a spatial pattern that is dominant in the underlying data, and they are organized in decreasing order of energy. Common codes like MATLABs or Python's SVD will output the column vectors in order of energy, and I recommend if you're interested to look into the QR decomposition if you really want to understand how this matrix can be obtained. The second matrix, sigma, is a diagonal matrix, and each one of its diagonal entries represents the square root of the energy of the data along the corresponding singular vector. Finally, the third matrix, V, is also unitary and is usually represented transposed. Each one of its columns is also a singular vector. If we organize our data matrix A such that the columns represent evolution in time, each column of V is a time series for the corresponding spatial basis vector of U. Let's first have a look at the mode matrix U. As we discussed, each column of this matrix is a mode or a basis vector, which for our set of simulation snapshots can be unpacked into a picture of the same size as the original snapshots. Each one of these images is a spatial mode constructed with the underlying data. Moving in this mode direction is like increasing or decreasing the intensity of this image. As it turns out, the first mode is just the average of this dataset, since in this case the average has not been subtracted. This means that the first few modes should give us a pretty good approximation of the underlying data, which allows us to compress the data and may also help us to interpret the data. The second matrix we'll be looking at is the energy matrix, sigma. Its interpretation is much easier since it's just a diagonal matrix. Each diagonal element of this matrix is related to the amplitude of the corresponding mode. And we can see here that only the first modes have really high energy, and the higher order modes or the higher modes have less energy, meaning that they represent tiny variations in the data that might even be ignored, they might even be noise. And finally, the V matrix contains time coefficients for each mode if the underlying data is organized as snapshots in time. Different than the sigma matrix, this matrix has non-zero entries everywhere, showing how the corresponding mode oscillates in time in order to reconstruct the original data. Okay, so now that we have a good grasp of the mathematical machinery, let's discuss why I personally find this technique quite useful to understand data in the context of fluid dynamics. Let's say we have a simple propagating sine wave. We can take snapshots of this wave to produce our matrix A. We know that a traveling sine wave can be successfully generated by a pair of two stationary sinusoids that are out of phase. This just comes from an elementary trigonometric relationship. So the question is whether POD can show us that. If we perform the POD algorithm in this dataset, we get many modes, but only two modes with any meaningful amount of energy, as we can see by looking into the sigma matrix. If we multiply the U and the sigma matrix, we get an energy wave mode matrix that contains the spatial functions that reconstruct the data. If we now look at the first two modes that have no negligible energy, we see that they represent a pair of sinusoidal waves with a phase delay. These would be like the cosine of minus kx and the sine of minus kx functions shown in the previous equation. These two functions would be multiplied by the corresponding time sinusoidals in the V matrix which when added together would produce the original traveling wave from the data. Remember, POD didn't know how we generated this data. It simply tried to distill the most energy out of the data by keeping the orthogonality condition. But this demonstrates that POD is a pretty good tool for identifying wave behavior in datasets.
In Fluid Dynamics, waves show up all the time, making PLD an incredibly powerful tool for analyzing this kind of data. So now, let's discuss the more philosophical point of when it makes sense to use PLD and what we can learn from looking at the mode representations it produces. Well, I'm not going to go through the math in this video, but the modes we see in the U and the V matrices are actually the eigenvectors of the correlation matrix. If you guys are interested, I may make another video on that. Since the modes that we see in the U matrix are the eigenvectors of the temporal correlation matrix, the most energetic modes that we see are actually representing spatial patterns where the data is most temporally correlated. It might be useful to find relationships between phenomena in your dataset. For example, a small disturbance in this region is causing a large disturbance in that region in this airfoil trailing edge. As we learned in the previous section, the S and the V matrix can only scale the intensity of each one of the corresponding modes in the U matrix, meaning each mode can only pulsate, in a sense. To generate the traveling wave behavior, we need to combine two phase delayed waves from separate modes. If you see a pair of modes with a similar picture, but different phases in your PLD decomposition with similar levels of energy, this might be a pretty good indication there is an underlying traveling wave. There's a lot more than I can talk about on the interpretation and the properties of PLD, but this video is already pretty long. I hope this was useful for you, and if so, please drop a like. Also, check out some of my other projects, and if you'd like to follow up on my next videos, please subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye.